Welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. This week on the show, we throw ourselves into a trap-filled zombie-infested island with Resident Evil Revelations 2. Would you become a fear? Plus, Goose shuffles the deck with Hand of Fate. One lives and one dies. Let us see what you are made of. And we try to stay out of the shadows in White Knight. My fear of being wounded changed into an obsession. Was I about to die? But first, can you name this game? And now here's Goose, who's got a bit of news for us. Ooh. Here's what's making headlines. Video game classification in Australia may soon be getting an overhaul. Minister for Justice Michael Keenan has announced there will be a 12-month trial for a globally unified rating system known as the International Age Rating Coalition, or IARC. Currently, the IARC is used in 35 other nations and allows for creators to rate their own material simply by filling out a questionnaire, which then allocates the appropriate classification for each country. This would make the job of classifying the large number of digital game releases significantly easier. The trial will commence next month. Electronic Arts has closed down its primary Maxis studio in Emeryville, California, with an undisclosed number of employees being laid off or moved into other studios. The Emeryville Maxis studio was responsible for creating SimCity, The Sims and Spore. EA has stated the development of The Sims and SimCity franchises will continue at other Maxis studios around the world. Oh. <laughs> 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 Microsoft has revealed that Kudo Sonoda will be expanding his role within the company. Sonoda previously worked closely on developing various technologies such as the Kinect and the upcoming HoloLens. He will now oversee many of Microsoft's first-party studios, including Lionhead and Rare, as well as managing third-party partnerships. The promotion was part of a wider shakeup within Microsoft's gaming division, with several general managers changing studios. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. A dark night, an abandoned house, the ghost of a jazz singer and a family mystery are all pieces of a complex puzzle that is White Knight. White Knight is a 3D point-and-click mystery and the first game from Awesome Studio. There's no shortage of ideas packed into this indie title, possibly too many. Yeah, it does feel like there's a little bit of overreaching in the execution of this game, but before we talk ambition, we should start with the story. It's a dark night, and you're behind the wheel after a long night of drinking. That's dangerous. A sudden ghostly apparition on the road causes you to crash. And now you're alone, injured, and need help fast. So, what do you do? Well, you head for the big scary mansion that looks like it's the holiday house of Norman Bates, of course. Yes, but naturally the house known as Vesper Manor is empty. Hello. I need an ambulance. Can you hear me? None of the phones work, there's mess everywhere, and it's haunted. And so begins your point-and-click, puzzler, film noir, survival horror, satanic ritual, serial killer, family mystery saga. Another one? I know, right? The story is pieced together via diary entries, newspaper clippings, old photos and random notes left around the house. We won't give too much away about the story, but basically the soul of a jazz singer needs to be saved and it's your ticket to freedom. Having a singer at the centre of this does allow for some good use of music through the game, and I think this was its strongest element. It takes eternity. Yeah, I liked those musical moments too. The key to surviving the night is by staying in the white light by any means necessary. Whether it's matches, fireplaces, or overhead lights. Stay in the shadows too long and it's lights out for you. Along with avoiding the shadows, the house also has a terrible ghost infestation, and it's best to keep away from those nasties too. Your only real defence is to run away as fast as possible, but all too often the deaths feel cheap. Yeah. I do like that weird fly-swatting move you do when you're consumed by the ghosts, though. Yeah, it's like a slap fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like... I won. You're quite good at that.
As I mentioned before, I think the main problem is that there are just too many ideas competing for your attention. Yeah, the game never really gets the chance to flesh any of these ideas out properly, does it? No, and you know, blending genres can really work, but you've got to get your basic mechanics working first, especially the art style. I love the idea of an all black and white world, and we have seen that used to great effect in The Unfinished Swan and Limbo, for example, but those games gave you a much better sense of space and environment. But in this game, I was just constantly lost in that contrast. Yeah, I found that a little bit at the start, but once I got my bearings, it wasn't too bad. I think one thing that could have helped would have been highlighting some objects or areas with a colour, just so that you know where you're coming and going. I also found some of the fixed camera angles didn't help either. I was often doing that which way am I going dance. What do you think of the puzzles, Hex? I mean, I thought they were adequate, but not exactly challenging. You know, there's a lot of collect this, plug that in, switch this on. It becomes less about figuring out what to do and more about just performing a list of tasks. Yes, they drove me to a new level of insanity. <laughs> It was just such busy work, finding logs of wood to start a fire and light bulbs for lamps. And those brutal checkpoints don't help when you have to go back and do all of that all over again. Yeah, it's infuriating having to replay so much. That said, at the core of this, behind all of the rough edges, is quite a good story. The writing didn't always hit the mark. Surviving is a full-time job, not the kind of job you can afford to lose. But I did want to see it through and save the soul of the jazz singer. I'm giving this two and a half stars. I think it's fantastic that a new studio has been so ambitious and there is a lot of good work here, but no matter which way I look at it, Hex, I just did not enjoy my time in <laughs> Vesper Manor, so I'm going to give it one star. Card games have been making a noticeable comeback of late, and now Australian studio Defiant Development bring us Hand of Fate, a digital deck builder with a difference. Ah, one more for the game. Come, Sid. You have passed the 13 gates. And you come to my table to play the game of life and death. Your stake is wagered. I refuse none who come here. Yet, I say, turn back. Another success story from the Australian Interactive Games funding program, Hand of Fate is a roguelike adventure game that uses cards as the framework for all of its gameplay mechanics. Now we play. You play a voiceless warrior who stumbled across a mysteriously charismatic old conjurer known only as the Dealer. What brings you to play the game? He welcomes you to his table and warns you of the dangers that lie within his devilishly tricky game. Luckily, he also serves as your guide. Now all you need to do is find and kill the Jack of Skulls and we can progress. Which is extremely useful as the game throws a lot of different concepts and rules at you right from the beginning. Unlike traditional battle card games that see you building up your deck to verse an opponent, Hand of Fate draws more from traditional dungeon crawlers or adventure games of old. At the start of each round, cards are laid out on the table as pathways to traverse with your player's token. The ultimate goal being to navigate a set number of these layouts until you reach and defeat each deck's boss card. Plague and pestilence and blood and teeth. <laughs> It's a deceptively simple concept that becomes more and more complex the further you progress. Customization in the game comes in the form of building two separate decks at the beginning of each round. One for equipment and the other for encounters. Equipment cards represent gear that can be won or found during your adventure, while the encounter cards make up the pathways you'll traverse. The catch being that in each round, the dealer will also add a number of his own cards that carry with them generally negative effects like curses and fiendishly deadly encounters. How boring life would be without a little spice. Along your journey, you'll also be able to earn and spend gold on things like gear, health, food, as well as purchase buffs called blessings and remove curses. Saving up enough for these can actually be quite hard work, and as you begin each round with the same basic equipment, gearing up your hero as early as possible becomes vital to surviving the hand. And it's these clever, well thought out rules that really add life to the game. One of the best examples is the food mechanic. Starting with a set amount, your hero will consume food as he moves across the table, gaining health as he does so. 
but running out of food will cause your hero to starve and begin taking damage. I would feed you if I could. By adding this resource, the game cleverly restricts your movement around the table and forces you to plan at least two moves ahead to keep your hero alive. The encounter cards, however, each have a detailed description of the event in the style of an old-fashioned pen and paper RPG. You might, for instance, find yourself in a tavern being approached by a badly disguised goblin who's asking for food, or discover a suspicious-looking treasure chest waiting to be plundered. Do you feed the goblin some bread off your plate, or try prying open the chest to see what lies inside? It all feels like it's been pulled straight out of a game of D&D, and it's really refreshing being able to read these little descriptions and let your imagination do all the work for you. As you progress through each hand, much of the major decision making is dictated by a four card chance minigame. Choose from these options. It is a novel way to decide the outcome of your decisions, but I felt it got overused quickly and skill would often just give way to pure luck. Which I guess does feel more like a genuine card game, but never really feels fair in the digital realm. What does feel more at home are the combat scenarios, and these take place any time your hero encounters enemies along his journey. During these, the game switches to a standard third-person brawler, with cards translating to real-world elements and health carried over from the card table. The combat itself feels heavily influenced by the Batman series, with a strong focus on counters and linking combos together. It's obviously nowhere near as polished, and fights can easily get messy with a wonky camera and some sluggish control inputs. But for the most part, it's a great way of literally interpreting these little skirmishes. Winning these battles and encounters will earn you new cards at the end of each round as well as the ability to remove trickier cards from your hand. So there is some strategy, but it's never certain whether you'll actually see any of these cards on the table, as ultimately your face is decided by the draw of the dealer, and it's here where the game truly earns its namesake. Often I'd just be having a perfect run, lots of food, plenty of gold, a powerful weapon, and then just after a few bad cards in a row I was left without a shield, cursed to lose all my gold and starving. Two more moves and I'd be dead or worse, starting a fight with barely any health. It's infuriating and it feels brutally unfair when it does happen, but then again that's what makes a good card game, and getting that right in a video game is certainly an achievement. Unfortunately, this bittersweet feeling eventually just turned sour for me as I got closer to the game's final few hands. Landing on the same tough pre-stacked encounter card starts to feel cheap and repetitive, plus battles in the latter half of the game tend to rely on flooding the arena with previous enemies as a way of increasing the challenge. And while it did only take a few extra runs to finally get a lucky hand and reach the end, it was still sad to see so many clever game mechanics undermined by some really outdated difficulty spikes. To be fair though, I was just as quick to come back to the game as I was to walk away from it, which is surely a sign of some great game design, or that the devs did a lot of research into gambling, or maybe both. Petty treasures retrieved from death and disaster. Either way, Hand of Fate's clever interpretation of card game mechanics, combined with its seesaw brawler to tabletop gameplay, makes for a really clever and unique experience, and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. So I'm giving it 4 out of 5 stars. <laughs> Shall we deal again? The game begins. Bioterror. The world lives with it. You live with it. Viruses are stolen, re-engineered, misused with tragic results. And who are you supposed to trust? We are the unflinching mop that sops up the evils of bioterrorism and chemical warfare. They call us... Terror Save. Resident Evil Revelations 2 is the follow-up to the excellent 3DS survival horror game, which also had a PC release not too long ago. Oh, that first Revelations hex, so good. It successfully recaptured the tension and thrill of what made this series so great, without feeling dated. I loved its shorter episodic feel too. Yes, it certainly was a good mix of old school survival horror with updated controls. I mean, you could shoot and move, 
at the same time. Yes, an actual revelation. Revelations 2 skips all Nintendo consoles this time around, but it's pretty much on every other platform. It begins with Claire Redfield and Moira, who is Barry Burton's daughter, Hey Claire! as they're abducted at gunpoint <laughs> and dumped on a mysterious prison island. My name is Moira Burton. Some kind of monsters have killed the others. Please, send help! Please! You play four characters in Revelations and always two at a time. Claire Redfield is a tough soldier, ready for anything and trained in every weapon you can imagine. Go away. Go away. <laughs> he went flying! Her partner Moira has a flashlight to help find pickups and blind enemies. She also has a crowbar for follow-up kills and getting into crates. Barry Burden, one of my favourite characters from the series, comes to the island to find his daughter Moira. and he's instantly paired up with a creepy child known as Natalia. Her ability is pointing. Be careful. What's wrong? I think I saw something. There's something ahead. Be careful. That's right, when you play as Natalia, it's a third person pointer. But she can also see enemies through walls and throw the odd brick. They're up against a strain of the zombie virus that goes nuts every time you experience fear. The island is, of course, an experimental sanctuary for zombie virus testing. Someone known as the Overseer directs the deadly situations you find yourself in through cameras, and it's up to you to work your way through a variety of deadly puzzles and traps. And, of course, lots of zombies. <laughs> As you progress, you always have this sinking feeling that there isn't actually any way out, and every break you get is always orchestrated by this overseer. It's not a very imaginative plot or setting, is it, Hex? No, it's a pretty grimy location too, not a whole lot of colour or light. In fact, it even reminded me of old school Silent Hill at times. And. That's not really a bad thing. I mean, this is horror. It's just nothing we haven't seen before visually, and it doesn't really give off a triple A vibe. And I have to say, even for zombies, these guys are pretty brain dead. Dialogue is functional and does its best to drive the story forward. The banter between characters feels right, but don't expect a huge amount of depth to it. Listen, there's a bad lady in the tower out there. Once we take her out, we can all leave the island together. Which is pretty much a standard rule when it comes to Resident Evil. Yeah, I think so. Just assume there'll be Wesker at some point. Wesker. And a bunch of virus stuff that's probably quite confusing. Shame about your friend. But you're tougher than he is. Even so, Hex, I did quite enjoy this storyline and how all the plots cross over. He's got the oba -oba 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 virus. In fact, the level design crosses over too as you start switching between the characters. At first I thought this was a bit lazy, but then I started to really enjoy going back to these previous locations and opening up new routes. Yeah, me too. And the repeat zones don't overstay their welcome, which stops them from becoming tiresome. And because you know the layout already, those items you couldn't reach with one character, even though they were right in front of you, suddenly become a possibility with another. It's good backtracking. I like that they've continued this episodic structure too, with previously on and next time on. Previously on Revelations 2. Yes, and we said this with the last Revelations and pretty much every time we've ever come across it, but more games need to do this. Yes, I agree. They've also released this game episodically, which I think is a good move. It means you can just buy the first chapter if you want to, and then make up your own mind as to whether you're invested enough to play and pay for the rest. Although early on, there are some sections that might turn people off, such as when you escape from that first zone. Oh, yes. 
Just when you've worked out how to take down regular zombies and learn to fight off some of the tougher ones, they all decide to get together and have a dinner party. Where your face is the main course. Much. Oh, I just found that section so frustrating, Bajo. Me too, but that's kind of core of the Resident Evil design. They have these big action sequences, and somewhere in the middle is a puzzle you need to figure out, or you're just dead. And like them or not, I think sections like this are meant to be full on and feel unfair. And it stops you from just running and shooting the whole game. It breaks up the gameplay. <laughs> You can play through the campaign in local co-op, although the official PC patch was only in beta at the time of recording. I'm coming. I'm crowbarring him, it's all good. <laughs> no, not all good. <laughs> run, run, run. I'm here. I helped. <laughs> it's certainly a much easier game with a human buddy, and there is some fun there to be had. That small co-op screen is frustrating though, and it's strange not to have online support built in. And I'm still not sure if online is actually coming. I can't find any official information on it. Oh gosh. <laughs> Although co-op isn't much fun if you're playing Natalia or Moira, the utility characters. Bricks are your thing. Okay. You've trained, you're trained in the art of bricks. Brick usage. Well, it's different being less involved in the combat, and I don't think it's always a bad thing, but for this particular game, I really do just wish I was on my own. No AI, no buddy. Oh, shiny! Pick it up. Oh, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. Why can't I use the handgun ammo? I'm just not sold on this two-character system they keep cramming into this series, whether it be with AI or a friend. I'm in two minds about it. It's a different kind of tension in co-op. When playing with a friend, you tend to be less cautious, and you separate more, which can lead to issues when one player is in trouble. Ow. Bit of a problem there. <laughs> but yes, with the Resident Evil 1 remaster not too long ago, we were reminded just how much fun it is to be alone in these games. I just hate babysitting NPCs. I'm on the way! And, you know, they get themselves in trouble all the time. I shouldn't go on ahead. What I found frustrating about the AI most of all, though, is just trying to figure out when your teammate is actually in trouble. You never really know if they're invincible or if you need to save them from a fight that they're in. I hate babysitting too, and I agree, there's quite a few deaths that feel cheap because the AI just does not know what to do. But it does add an interesting element to the fights and puzzles. There's something right there. I don't know what you're seeing, but point me at it. I think the best use of co-op is when you're up against invisible enemies that only Natalia can see. You have to switch between her and Barry to get a line of sight on them, or just aim where you can see that she's pointing. Yeah, I like that mechanic a lot. There's also raid mode, and this sees you moving through a bunch of levels, and it's essentially a wave mode with lots of unlocks and progression. There is a fair bit to it, but it did feel like a one-time affair for me. That gunplay in combat is great, though. Absolutely. Along with the perk trees mixing up your combat style, you'll be focusing a lot on reload management and keeping your distance from everything that has guts coming out of it. You'll also be watching for melee opportunities to save on ammo. And when it all comes together, it feels great. Is that a guy? Stop it. Stop it. No. And when it doesn't, it goes very bad. There's solid creature design from the bosses to the standard zombies, which I think is the biggest strength of the game. I also thought weapons handled well, and there's plenty of augments to swap in and swap out as you progress. It's so good to have Barry Burton's Magnum back in the game. Boom! And I like that enemies don't drop ammo or pickups. This means you don't waste your time checking bodies. It's more scavenging what you can find about the rooms. I also quite like that you use the torch or the third person pointing to find extra ammo when you're running low. It means the pace is kept up because you're not scavenging all the time, but you can still get that help when you need it. Yeah, and that's actually my favourite part about Revelations 2, Barjo, that you're always running out of ammo. Even experienced players will often get down to their last bullet at times. It works so well, doesn't it? I think that's key to keeping things really stressful. Every shot I missed just made me wince and cringe. Yeah, I mean, to the point where you really get annoyed at yourself if you waste too much. And that's not an easy thing to get right in survival horror games either. Although I do wonder who's leaving all these precious gems everywhere. <laughs>
Topaz all over the place. They might as well call it Topaz Island. I like a bit of Topaz. Yeah, me too. I don't have many gripes with this game, actually, Hex. And, you know, the more I played of it, the more I started to forget those gripes anyway and really get into the groove. For me, Bajo, it was actually kind of the opposite. The more I played, the less I enjoyed the game's lack of colour and light. I think overall the tone of this game just wore me down a bit. Well, for me, it's that Resident Evil formula that always pulls me in. You walk into a room and you're given something like a locked door, usually. Sometimes a puzzle, a switch, a missing object. This is Neil's. Something to give you a goal to put on the back of your mind. So you're always moving forward onto the next thing while you're still finishing off the last thing you had to do. So you're never at a loss as to what your next objective is. Revelations 2 doesn't reinvent the franchise, but it's a solid addition and there's a lot here to like. I'm giving it three and a half. Now this one is especially for the fans or those who crave a split screen experience, which is a rare commodity in games these days. I'm giving it two and a half. Let's check out his pants. Fashion break. Yeah, shouldn't have skipped leg day, bro. Okay. All right, Agent Goose. I'm keeping him busy with the cat memes and approaching him from the south. Affirmative, I see you. We're cutting off from the north. <laughs> no more games, Bajo Pants. <laughs> Oh, Hex, the real question is, did you name the game for this week? It was Ski Safari from 2013. You are Sven, innocently getting some shut-eye when suddenly an avalanche disrupts your peaceful morning. Staying ahead of the oncoming disaster is your objective, but you're not alone. Animal friends you pick up along the way help you move faster, further and higher. And it's our name the game because it was developed by Defiant Development, the same studio behind this week's Hand of Fate. Fun fact, their office is just down the road from ours. Yeah. Mm. Next week on the show, Shelter 2. We grew quite attached to our little family of badges in the last game, so it'll be interesting to see what horrific tragedies lay in store for the sequel's family of lynxes. <gasps> Kitties! Mm. They were gonna die there. Hey, are we sick of zombies yet? A little bit. Well, too bad, because we've got plenty to deal with in Zombie Army Trilogy. Over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3 this weekend, we prepare our vocal cords for a scream ride. Don't forget to check out Good Game Pocket, our daily dose of gaming goodness hosted by Hingers. Yes, you can find it on iView and YouTube, and it's got lots of news and first plays, first impressions, multiplayer sessions, and general shenanigans. Now it's pants soiling time. Ah, ah. You should have remembered that guy from before. Shut up. Why did he still scare you? Did you just hit me? That was you, but you know what? I, t I got taken out by a car so because I was too focused on hitting you with a shovel. All right, WASD to move your arms, J or K to rotate the doll. She's gone. Let's do it. I'm not trying to tell you how to play the I game have... or anything, but that's how you should play the game. You should reload now. This is not what I used my dolls for, can I just say? <laughs> I might have done sex 110 times, and I didn't get caught. Run, oh, run, 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 run. Ooh, wait. I think I you got him. him. I got him. Yeah, I got him. Congratulations. Well Thank done. You. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Marjo out. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Oh, pardon me. Oh, sorry. 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 Oh, no, no, no. Okay, you're on. Pardon me. Sorry. No, pardon me. Oh, sorry. Hey, get out of my way.